awesome nature of it, the seven weeks that have gone by as we've counted toward the day of Pentecost and have two days to give God glory, to give him honor, to put our focus and attention on him and his plan and what he's doing. And coming to this time when we talk about what it is that Jesus was promising, what it is that was coming to pass when he told his disciples to wait. Seven weeks ago, we talked about Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead during the days of unleavened bread. We talked about him as the first fruits offered to God, that he was the firstborn from the dead, the first raised up, and with him came a promise that as he would ascend to the Father, we would receive of the Holy Spirit by which we would receive the adoption to be sons of God, that we would be the children of God because Jesus made it possible through his sacrifice that we would be transformed from sinners to righteous, that we would be made into the image of our Lord and Savior, and it would happen because he would send the Spirit to us. He actually said, if you turn with me here to John chapter 16 and verse 7, John 16 verse 7, he says that, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. And a lot of us might think that, man, it would have been so cool to be a disciple living at the time that Jesus was on the earth, because then I could see, then I could know what to do, how to do it. And certainly we would have seen in the flesh the perfect example. God personified in flesh, tempted in all points, yet without sin, speaking the word in truth, perfectly following the will of God our Father in heaven. And here he is telling those who had followed him, it's to your advantage that I go. It's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I go, I will pray the Father... And he said, if it is your advantage, I go away, because if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So when we think about what Christianity really is, when we think about what makes us one of Christ's, it has to do with the Spirit. In fact, it says in Romans chapter 8 that if the Spirit of Christ is not in you, you are not his. It is what makes us part of the church. It's the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. The Holy Spirit promised to come. The Holy Comforter promised to come. And it's the Holy Spirit that changes everything, that gives us the advantage in this world. So friends, as we look at these verses today, there's a question that we we need to ask ourselves and that we need to understand in this good news that God has blessed us with is what is filling our lives the Spirit of God. A couple weeks ago when I had a chance to speak, I talked about the emptiness of obedience without the power of God, without the will of God, without the direction of God, and how there's an emptiness, an emptiness that can come because we can have right teaching, right theory, right philosophy, even right practice, but ultimately what fills what our hearts are longing for is the presence of God Almighty in our lives, and that is not just by a knowing in the head, it's by an experience, an experience of God Almighty dwelling within us, in our hearts and in our minds, that if he is not, we can have so much right and and not have a feeling in our lives. And so my call to you today is, if you have emptiness in your heart, if you are feeling empty in your life, if you're feeling this unknowing, accept that. Accept that as the calling of God to draw near, to receive the only, only thing that can satisfy us. It is only the Spirit of God that fills us and edifies us, that can take of the word and make it alive in here, that transforms life, that we, we don't have to run in pursuit of all the things that the world tells us we need, a new house, a new car, a new wife, a new house, spouse, whatever it is, because it all fades away in the light of God living within us and being God in our lives. There's no substitute for God. Remember when Jesus said to the 
he said to the Pharisees, he said, you search the scriptures daily because in them you think you have life. But you don't come to me, the one who will give you life. See, all of this seeking, all of this is not just so we can be puffed up with knowledge and with understanding. It's to, it's to humble us before God to say, God, you are God. So amazing, so brilliant, I need you. And all my life I'm created because you wanted to make me, because you wanted children and you chose me to be your child. And so it's the depth, it's the reality of being one of his, that Jesus would be with us always. Turn with me to John 14. Notice here in verse 15. John 14, verse 15. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And some translations have that, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Because the natural response of a love for God is to come in and say, what do you want me to do? I'm at your beck and call. I'm at your will. What is your will for me? Because you're the one who made me. You know why I exist. You know who you want me to be. If you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. What a blessing, what a promise. Do you remember on the day of Pentecost, as recorded in Acts 2, they were with one accord in one place. The Spirit came upon them. Peter began to speak and said, these guys aren't drunk. It's the Spirit of God. And he preached this wonderful sermon about Jesus Christ and how Jesus was prophesied to come. The Messiah was to come. And in through the Messiah, there would be life. But he said, this Jesus, him you crucified. And it says that they were cut to the heart. And what do we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise. This is what it is to be a disciple. To repent. To lay down our lives. And to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, for some of us, this has not always been an easy thing. I know for me, as I was talking a couple weeks ago, the emptiness of, of seeking God, but knowing, knowing that in my heart, really in the reality of it, in the practice of it, where was God? To be able to practice the things I know, to be able to know the things of God, to have the working with, but not the working in. And feel the emptiness that I just, I needed the relationship to be real. That if our Christianity is just in theory, and if our walk with God is just a theoretical philosophy, is it really what Jesus promised? Is it really what he said would happen in our lives? that we would be changed because the Spirit of God would live within us. He, notice again what he says, John chapter 14, verse 16, and I will pray the Father. The reality of that, of Jesus ascending to heaven, praying the Father, and he will give you another helper that you may abide, that he may abide with you forever the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive why not because it neither sees him nor knows him because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you i will not leave you orphans i will come to you now, on this verse 17, I want you to really think about this because Jesus is telling us the truth. The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. True? The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the world does not see him nor know him. Because the world does not see him nor know him. It's an interesting verse that ends in the, the closing in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. It's 
You might want to hold your place. I didn't tell you this in John, because we'll probably be hanging out in John today. 2 Corinthians 13. Notice in verse 14, the close of Paul's message here. He says that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So we talk about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, how basically by what he did, his loving kindness and favor toward us and his empowering presence and work changed us by his sacrifice and resurrection, didn't it? The love of God, what comes from God, what emanates from God's heart for us, his love, his compassion. We have these things and we enjoy these things. And then the communion of the Holy Spirit As you look at your life here today, do you see that you are engaged in a communion and a fellowship with the Holy Spirit? Because when we look at the book of Acts, what makes the book of Acts such an interesting read is that as the people were giving their lives to God, as they were coming under the grace of God, they were being filled with the Holy Spirit, they were being led by the Holy Spirit, they were being directed by the Holy Spirit, And the church was flourishing, and the individuals under God were flourishing in the exact ministries that God called them to do. Now, we've talked about the fact that as a church, as a body, this is not just a matter of there's some pastors or teachers, but that every person is called to ministry. And in our lives, we may not always know the direction of what that ministry looks like or what it takes whether it's a role for today or a role for the next year or a role for the rest of our lives. We don't know. But here's what we can say, that what we should be seeking is that the Holy Spirit is directing the movements of our lives, the ministries that we enter into, and empowering the very things that we've been told to do. This is the life that Jesus Christ wants us to to have. That's why it's an advantage that he went away, that we would receive of the Holy Spirit and that you and I would be communing with the Holy Spirit. And as we come together in the one spirit, the spirit says, Bill, do this. Cal, I need you to do this. Scott, go do this. Mark, go out. Here's what I want you to be doing. And all of us receive the direction from God, his lordship moving upon us, what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, and then giving us the power to accomplish the will of God. See, we as a church, if we're wondering where we go, how we fit in, how we live as children of God, the answer is by the direction of the Holy Spirit. It's how Christ comes to us. It's how the Father directs us with his will. Because it says the Spirit will not speak of its own. But as he hears from the Father, so he speaks. The Spirit. So notice here again in John 14. So the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. If we're going to be honest with ourselves, we have to ask, do we see him and do we know him? Because the world does not receive, because it does not see, it does not know. In our lives, this is a pursuit that we should be having, a humility before God to say, I need to see and know. How do I move without you, God? How do I go forward without you? If Jesus himself, when he was on the earth, said, I can do nothing except that which I'm directed to do. I don't speak my own words, but what I hear. I don't do my own works, but what I see. It's the power of God in our lives that changes everything. That changes the way we think, the way that we see. Hold your place here in John again. Turn with me over to Matthew chapter 16. Notice in Matthew chapter 16. In verse 23, actually, let's start back in verse 21. 
it says that from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised the third day. Now you can imagine watching through their time and experience with Jesus. They saw that there were other times where people picked up stones to stone Jesus and he got away or they took him out like to push him off a cliff and somehow he escaped. God always provided that way to escape. In fact, the scriptures say he, he provided the way because it wasn't yet his time to die. But now Jesus is telling him, this is what's going to happen to me. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. Or as some translations would have it, May the mercy of the Father be on you, Lord, that this thing not happen, this shall not happen to you. Now, wouldn't that seem like a good and right thing? No, God's going to protect you. God's going to prevent this from happening to you. This is not going to happen. Right? Peter loved Jesus. Peter's heart was to see Jesus protected. Is that a good and right heart? You could say, hey, that seems like a good and right heart. But was it filled with the counsel of God of what was going to come to pass? So what did Jesus say to him? Jesus says to Peter, verse 23, Get behind me, Satan, my adversary. To his own disciple, get behind me, adversary. Why would he say that? He said, you are an offense to me. You would cause me to sin. You would cause me to stumble in the thing that God brought me here to do. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. And I think that God inspiring this example for us is so powerful because Peter was a man with boldness for the Lord. He, he was a protector by nature, right? He, he wanted to protect. He wanted to help. And he was the one that God chose to give that sermon on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit came. But here is Peter being called an adversary. Here is Peter being told, you're an offense to me by his Lord Jesus. Can you imagine how crushing that would be to be told, you're an offense. You're in the way because you're not seeing the things of God. Now this teaching, this understanding should be a very powerful motivator in our lives to get on our knees and go before God and say, I don't want to do it my way. Because if God is saying this is the way and the way is suffering, why would we be seeking protection? Surely the mercy of God will protect you from this thing if what God has appointed is suffering. When he called the apostle Paul, do you remember when he sent Ananias, he said, because I'm going to show him the many things he must suffer for my name's sake. What a calling. Are you willing to embrace that calling? See, that's a tough calling, isn't it? You can only embrace that calling when you know it's your calling. Amen. To know the calling of God removes the doubt, removes the uncertainty, removes our own reason, even to what we think could be right, even what we might be able to prove is right. To know the power of God and what he directs and what he says. Remember when Paul was trying to go to teach and the Spirit says, no, you're not going there. What did Paul want to do? He wanted to go preach. How could that be wrong? Because where the Spirit wanted Paul to go was someplace else. See, in our lives, we can figure out preaching the gospel is a good thing. We have a general command to go forth, right, and preach the gospel to every creature. Paul was going forth to preach the gospel, and the Spirit said, No, I got somewhere else for you to be. How do we know what to do if we are not in communion with the Holy Spirit? Are we just reasoning in our own hearts and our own minds what to do? See, friends, when I go into my own heart, when I go into my own relationship with God, these are things that make me tremble. I don't, I don't want it my way. 
I, I know my way can be wrong even when I think I'm right. Even when I might have the right thing to say or to do, if it's not of God and of God's will, I might be going in a way like Peter saying, no, that may it not happen to you, Lord. And you say, you're an offense to me. I, I, there's another plan here. So you mean you really are Lord? You mean you really can direct my life? You mean you really have a path for me to go on? And it may not be the one that I thought it would be. When I was baptized in the Holy Spirit in my, my late 20s, when I finally came through all a time of hurting and seeking and wanting to know God, and through literally years of, of trying to undo myself before him and repent and seek and trying in my own strength and my own will and all of it, when he finally poured out the baptism of the Holy Spirit on me and I knew the cleansing of all the repenting that I had been doing and I knew the freedom and the liberty and the amazing joy, it's a day I will never forget because the waves of mercy and love and joy that filled me after so much anguish and saying, how long, O oh Lord, till you come and be real to me? That it, it, it put me in a whole different way of thinking and a way of path. And man, how many times I have fallen short since. But this is what I know, is that when you go where God wants you to go and you do what God wants you to do by his grace and by his power, you're in the zone. And the things that you would normally be afraid of, you're not. And the things that you're worried about, you don't. Because when you come to know the one, the only one you need to know, and the one that you need to know says, this is what you're going to do. You now have a calling. You now have a direction from the Lord who makes the things that he wants to happen, happen. See, that's what was awesome about the life of Paul. That's what's awesome about your life when you say, not my will, but yours be done. Let thy kingdom come, not my will, but yours be done. Direct my steps, direct my path. What would you have me do? And maybe God shows you big things, maybe God shows you little things. I can tell you that when I came to California, I did not know I was going to be pastor of Rock Valley Christian Church in Murrieta, California. No clue. In fact, if you would have asked me, I would have said, no, nah, I don't think I'm going the church route. Not as a pastor. Maybe just as a general teacher. Maybe just out there and certainly had opportunities to do that. But when you know from the Lord, I'm supposed to do this. Even the doubts that can creep in because of your flesh, it's like, but I got to. All my reasons might go against, this doesn't seem logical, it doesn't seem rational, it doesn't seem... But if I'm following God and he knows this is what I'm doing because of his leading, isn't that really the sum of everything? to fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. That's it. See, it doesn't really matter what we see after that point, does it? Because maybe the reason that he calls you to do something and what you think will happen when he does, maybe it looks completely different than you thought. That's okay. To be to be at the call of God. What I love about Pentecost was that there was a people waiting and praying together and coming together with one accord, waiting to receive power from on high and the direction for what God would have them to do.
And that's why Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go. Because when I come in your life, I'm going to show you what it is that I want you to do. In your life, as you have come to know Jesus Christ, as you have come to know God, are you settled in your mind that you have a communion with God that is leading you in the way to go in your life? See, if you're settled and you know, I'm doing the very thing God would have me do, you're in a place of peace, aren't you? That's a wonderful place to be. But if you find yourself today saying, I don't know, you are also in a very wonderful place. Because it's the I don't know, the humility to say, I don't know God, that humbles us before him to say, you do, show me. And we can expect the leading of God to come into our lives. And in fact, this very thing, it was the very verses that Chauncey was reading today. He said, I made you hunger so that I could test what was in your heart. I made you hunger so I could test what was in your heart. Whether you really believed that I exist and that I'm a rewarder of those who diligently seek me. See, here's the promise and assurance of God that if we seek him, believing not only that he is, but that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, as we come to know God and to please him, what he wants to do is pour out exactly what he wants us to do. He wants to make us his children. He wants us to be involved in and engaged in the things that he's doing. And he leads us in all the many ministries that are part of the body of Christ. So diverse are the ministries. So diverse are the talents, the gifts, the blessings that God pours upon his church. So diverse so that every member can do its share. There are simply things that I can't do, that you can't do, that we can't do, but there are others that God calls in the body with gifts and talents to bring, to help, to edify the body of Christ, to glorify God in heaven. And that's what I'm asking you today. Is God in your life? Is God leading your life? Because that's what Jesus said would happen. Notice he says, and again back in John, so verse 17, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Those are promises. So you, we can go to God and say, you promised this. You promised, Jesus, that you would come, that you would, that you would lead me, that you would guide me. Hold your place here and turn with me back to the book of Lamentations. And notice here in Lamentations chapter 3, when I was seeking God and I was going through so much torment in my own life, looking for God, knowing there was more of a relationship that I was not experiencing, that I had basically made my relationship a product of, of learning knowledge and practicing the knowledge that I learned, that I could tell that God was not actively involved in, in my life in the way that I was reading about. In Lamentations 3.22, it says, Through the mercies, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Scott, how long was it that Abraham, from the time God told him that he was going to make a great nation of him, how long was it from then till he had his son Isaac? 25 years. Notice that again, verse 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. 
It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. How long did Joseph wait when he got sold into slavery and then went into prison before he was raised up to be second in command? Does anybody know how many years that was? Anybody? So yeah, it was about a, so from the total from the time he was sold into slavery, don't quote me on this, but it was about 17, 18 years. I think it was 17, but 17 years he waited. And the time that he was waiting, he not only spent as a servant, sold, knowing that his brothers rejected him, knowing that his father was without him and he without his father, he was also in prison for things he didn't do. Talk about a time of waiting. There's a comfort in waiting upon the Lord that every person must engage in. Maybe the waiting is a moment. Maybe the waiting's a year. Maybe the waiting's whatever God needs it to be. But the thing is, he will cause us to be hungry to know our heart because what he wants to know in us is that the Lord is my portion. The Lord is my portion. Even when Abraham was told to take his son, the very promised son, and sacrifice him, where was Abraham's hope? It says in Hebrews, was that the Lord, even if he put him to death, could resurrect him. God is wanting to know in us, is he our portion? Now, you probably don't remember sermons the way I do, but because I, I preach them. But <laughs> I remember them better than you. It's just a fact. But when we started this count to Pentecost, we started it with a talk of what Jesus was doing to make you and me his portion. That we would be for the priest. That we would be Christ's at his coming. That we would be his. That the first fruits, they're the first redeemed from the earth and from among men. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. This is what you and I have been called to, to follow the lamb wherever he goes, to give him the honor, the glory in our lives, to walk according to his leadership. And he wants to know, is he the portion of our lives? So you might be asking for something, and God's answer is yes, but not yet. And in that moment, what bridges the gap between the things that we hope to receive and the actual receiving, it is faith. It is faith. Once you've received the thing, faith is no longer required. Now, as a body of believers, as coming together, you and I have been called to this place by God's selection. I don't know all the reasons that we were called together, but this I do know that the God that we worship, the God that we serve, is seeking to raise up a people committed to him, wholehearted in desiring his life and his ways in us, that we might offer up sacrifices pleasing to him in the name and to the glory of Jesus Christ, that we would know our King of kings and our Lord of lords, that we might be a light and a witness in a world of darkness and be a place of refuge when God calls to say, come out and be you separate. This world in which we live, this great Babylon that worships so many things other than the true God, that we could be a place that says God is first and his leadership in our life is supreme And we don't settle just for what we know. We want to know his will and his direction in our lives because he's our God. And we take this thing about confessing with our mouth Jesus is Lord as a serious thing. Lord, you can direct my steps. To the work I do, to the rest I take, you can direct my steps. And you make the appointments for me. Think of how brilliant it was that on the day of Pentecost, were the disciples going out and trying to convince people that Jesus was Lord? Or were they convinced Jesus was Lord and they were waiting because he said, wait? Were they ministering to him by praying together in one accord, as it says in Acts? They were all together praying together. Acts 2, they're together with one accord. How 
Did God do it to bring 3,000 people to repentance? By having a people waiting for him. And he poured the spirit out and the peoples came to them. He did it. He did it. He made it happen. See, the key is whether we are waiting for God to send people to us or whether God is sending us out, as the Holy Spirit later said, separate Paul and Barnabas uh, to me for the work that I've called them to do. The reality is they were waiting on God too, weren't they? They were fasting and praying and seeking God, and the Holy Spirit spoke, separate these two to me. As a church, this has to be at the core of who we are. Otherwise, we go through the motions of having a form of godliness and a form of religion, but none of the power and the reality of it. And that's not what God called us to do, was go through the forms. God called us to be surrendered to him and to realize that he has a plan and purpose for you and me. He has a plan and purpose for our lives. And through his will and work by the spirit of God within us, we not only become children of God, we look and walk and talk and act like the children of God in the power of God. See, this is what God has called you to. It's an amazing calling. And it's worth taking the instruction. Verse 25, again of Lamentations 3, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. To bear that yoke in your youth. We're all young in this room. <laughs> Compared to God, what is our age? How old are we? If you had to spend the rest of your life hoping and waiting for the glory of God, would you do it? If you're saying, I'm at your will today, God, whatever you want, I do. Where you want to lead me, I want to go. See, the commitment that we're making is something that is putting our life down for Christ as he laid down his life for us to say all that I am is yours. Because what I'm seeking is not the things that are found in the rewards of the world. I'm seeking treasures in heaven. And so he calls us to be poor of heart and spirit before him to look for his word and his direction in our lives and to not be satisfied with things less. How often will we eat of things that cannot satisfy? How long will we drink of that which cannot quench our thirst? That's what he says. The power of a wholehearted nature before God. Turn back to John 14 with me. Notice what he says here. John chapter 14 in verse 23, Jesus answered and said to them, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. So it's, it's kind of interesting that the last verses we read, it began with, If anyone loves me, he will keep my commandments. Here he says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. That is a promise. That is a promise from God that he will make his home with us and he who does not love me does not keep my words. So the evidence, the evidence of our love is keeping his word, isn't it? Why would that be? Because when we love God and come to know him as God, isn't what he wants us to do what we want to do? Because of our love for him, our devotion unto him? He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. It's the Father's word that we want to hear, the Father's leading to know him, to embrace him. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, verse 25, verse 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. 
the reality of this relationship and the need for this relationship in our lives cannot be overemphasized. Friends, we, we cannot be Christians without the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We can't be. There is a constant need to eat and drink of the bread of life and of the Spirit of God. There's a constant need. We have no more sustenance of life than if we just stopped eating and drinking. Our spirits starve like our bodies do when we don't eat and drink of the true. The thing is, it seems like it's easier for us humanly, maybe because we grow up in it, maybe because we're used to it, to fast from God. We cry out when our bodies fast. But our spirits cry out in a way we don't even recognize the calling so much, the crying, the longing. But when we know the satisfaction of the spirit of God within us, he makes us want more and more and more. That's, that's these songs that we sing about more, pour it out, pour it out. I want more. I want more because I don't want to be ever away from you, God. And that heart, God is calling out, will you be a people with a heart that will stand up and say, I want all the blessings and all the leadership of God in my life. That's the beautiful calling that is, is, is on your life, that, that you would have the leadership of God in the knowing of what he would have you and me to do in our lives, that we would be a blessing to him. Turn with me over to uh, John chapter 15, and in verse 22, he says, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. And now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. And if they had not done among them, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and they have also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the Holy Spirit comes, who I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. The difference is Jesus Christ. You and me have life because he is the way, the truth, and the life. This is not just a theory. This is a reality that where he is, there is life. That where Jesus Christ is, there is sanctification. There is hope. There is righteousness. There is power from on high. There is healing. There is deliverance. There is freedom. See, what our world is looking for is the satisfaction that will come to heal the heart. And right now, the world is looking for a way to heal the heart by saying, don't do anything that can hurt my heart so I can be healed. And in every way that anything that could make me feel bad or feel shame or feel guilt, don't talk about that. That's the world's way of being whole, of being at peace. And what God is saying is, there's a way of life, a way of living that I've been teaching that if you break it, it is going to bring shame and guilt. And rather than running from the shame and guilt, embrace the shame and guilt and say, I'm guilty. And I need Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins and my iniquities. See, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives is constant to transform us into the very children of God that we would know the lordship of Jesus, and that we would depend on his constant ministry and work in our lives, that we would not seek to have a life where we say we're Christians, but we're, we're going our own ways. We're saying, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? Are you with me? Are you with me, friends? Are you with me being all for God? Because if not, what are we doing? Are we just being lukewarm? Are we just being neither hot nor cold? God says, I'll spit you out. Because I don't, I don't want you lukewarm. 
The Holy Spirit testifies to us of Jesus so we see the passion of what a heart of love looks like. We can see his wholehearted nature of what he laid down for us so that we can respond to that love with love itself. Unto him, for his glory and for his honor. The Holy Spirit coming among us to lead us and guide us in the ways that we should go. Friends, there is no substitute for this. He says that when the Helper comes, verse 26, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Turn with me over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. It says in verse 14 that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, verse 15, but you received the spirit of adoption. We received such a beautiful notification this week. Our friends John and Tanya from Arizona who have been foster parents, John has spoken about it at the feast, I think it was last year, right? Just about his work. There was a young boy and uh, had come into their care right after he was born, a babe. His name was Dwayne, I think it was. And they didn't want to call him Dwayne because Dwayne had a bad meeting or something. So they kept calling him Buddy. And they were hoping that he could be their own because Buddy was born into a household where... There wasn't love, there wasn't care, there wasn't provision, there wasn't protection. There was abuse, there was violence, there was vice. Everything he was born into was creating already in his little life, in the first months of his life, trauma, experiencing violence, experiencing the coldness of a life without love. And John and Tanya took that little boy in, and from the beginning, their heart was set on him. They loved him. They could see what he had gone through, and they were touched by him. And their heart was just to, to pull him out of that place. Out of the abandonment. Out of the disregard out of the place that causes lawlessness to abound because love is so cold, it produces all this fear and torment in even the babes that are born. And the card this week said, the date that he was born, the date that they entered the house, and the date that he becomes their child. The spirit of adoption. The spirit of adoption by which he goes from a place of horror to a home where he's going to be loved and cared for and protected and instructed and nourished because they love him. And God has looked down on you and me and said, I see exactly the things that are going on in your heart. I see exactly your hurts. I know your fears. I know the bondages in your life. I know the ways that you have disregard. And I love you. And I'm offering to you, I'm telling you, I choose you to be my child. 
I choose you to come into a house of love. I choose you that you would be healed. I choose you that you would know me and be acquainted with me. And God is calling out, receive the spirit of adoption by which your hurts and wounds can be healed. For the spirit of the Lord, Jesus said, is upon me to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, to bring at liberty those who are bound. And you and me have every right to expect that work from God because he didn't just call us to fritter along in this life. He called us to be his children and to know and experience what this is, that we can have the health of God in our lives, that we can share this health with others. God makes us healthy so we can help others be healthy. To bring us to a family of love where the ways of God go forward and where his spirit abounds in the work to do. Friends, this is where the calling of God in our lives comes and it comes to us as individual members when we submit to the head. We join as a body under the head, but individually as members, we have to say, God, I need you. I don't want to go in my own way without you any longer. I want you because with you is blessing, with you is life, with you is hope, and not just for me, but for others. Could we be content to have for ourselves if it wasn't abounding over to give to someone else? to look out and say, what can we do to share the goodness that God has blessed me with with somebody else? And it's the nature of God that we do this thing together. Friends, we should have so much hope and so much joy because we have a Father who loves us this much, who chooses us and says, I want you for mine. I want you to be mine. And with me comes all the blessings of my house. In my house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Do not be fearful or troubled, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. We have the hope of a God who's coming again. We have a hope of a God who says, and I'm not leaving to leave you as orphans. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. Know him. Receive him. Be taught by him. Friends, this is just such an awesome calling. It is just such an awesome calling to know the sincerity of heart that our Father has toward us that we might be called the children of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, as we come before you today, we are just so thankful to you for the hope that you give to us, the sincerity of heart and mind by which you approach us and by which you want to speak to us to bless us with your Holy Spirit, to bless us with the knowledge of who you are, to bless us that we would come to know a way of life that that comes from your heart, your wisdom, your direction, the things that you pursue, that, God, that we would pursue the things that you pursue, that we would love the things that you love, that we would honor you, that we would love you as you have loved us, and that, God, in every way that our hearts would be healed, and that, God, you would break off from us any misdirections in our lives where we have been reasoning and rationalizing what's good and what's right, and not simply looking to you for your guidance by your spirit and your word to lead us into the paths of righteousness that we may be your children. And God, as we have heart and desire to not just have for ourselves, but to have for this community, for this state, for this nation, for this world, God, as we desire to be helpers in other people's joy, to be helpers in bringing others to know your son, to know the liberty of life in Jesus, We ask you, God, please, as we worship you, as we praise you, as we serve you, as we come together to love you and to love one another and to have consideration for one another, that, God, as we look up to you and and we, we look to praise you, God, to serve you, we ask that you would pour out the blessing from heaven, that you would open 
the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on this society that, that, that people would be awakened to you and to your goodness and to your glory. That God, the things of this world would just look so insufficient that they would just look like boredom, that they would look like nothing compared to the glory that is in you. That even the temporary pleasures would not be pleasurable anymore. We praise you and we thank you, God, that you are our portion, that you are who satisfies us, that you are our life, that we would give you honor in every way, that we would give you glory in every activity that we do, that we would always be available and in the present to honor you, to worship you, and to praise you. God, I pray you pour out your spirit on us. Pour it out, pour it out, God, that we would be filled with your power from on high, that God, in every way you would direct our steps, and in every way you would cause us to be as a blessing to you and a blessing to others. For God, how many people are calling out and crying out to know you, to come out of the facades of religion, to come out of the ways of this world, to know the purity of of your holy word and the purity of your Holy Spirit and to be in fellowship with you, God, where there is no fear, where there is no doubt, where there is no uncertainty, but we know that we know you and in you we live and we move and we have our being. You are our everything. God, we pray this not just for ourselves but for all we are not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. You are the God who does big things. You are the God who does mighty things. You are the God that knows his people. And we pray you call out to this community that we live in. Pour out in this community that we live in. Shine your light brightly in this community that we live in, God, that there would be a revelation of who you are, that those who go into bars to drink to find satisfaction would stop to drink of you. The people that are looking for love in relationships and in adulteries and fornications, God, that they would find that love is in you that, God, there would be no more greed or stealing, that it would just all seem so stupid and vain, knowing it all just blows away and it's dust in the wind because it's only you who lives forever and your children and your kingdom that endures forever and ever. Amen. Oh, God, please, please, Holy Father, pour out your mercies on our community. Pour out your mercies on our neighborhoods. Pour out your mercies, God, for where you break up the hard ground and where you break up the soil, God, where you can break up that ground, your word and your spirit can go in to bring life. And God, we ask you please to bring life for those who need life, for those who are suffering, for those who are hurting. And God, in any way that we can, that we can be of help to people, that God, that we can bring help to them by your spirit and minister in your spirit and with your word and God that life can abound in this place God break off the shackles and the blindness and the untruth that is in our society and in our community break off the depravity that defines this nation and God let us turn away from the things of our lusts and our flesh and God forgive us our iniquities that we may have your spirit and your life within us and that your power would come down and that your light would shine in this place, God. That your glory would go forth, God. That you would be glorified and that you, Lord Jesus, would be seen as Lord, Lord of all. And that, God, you would bring about repentance and heart and mind coming before you with such need and that you would bless us with your spirit in every occasion in every divine appointment, God, to meet the need with your spirit and your word and that you would bless it, that you would bless the planting of your word, the water, that you would shine brightly, God, that in every way, God, that you would go forth with your work. God, we plead the blood of Jesus on this community, the forgiveness of sins. We plead that you would help us, God, for we are a corrupt people who have turned from you and we have gone our own ways. Bring us back to you, God. Bring us back that we would know you and that we would know the power of your love, God, and that in every way, God, our hearts would be committed. Cause us to break off all the nonsense 
that is of this world, the things that are vain and that all are slipping away, God, and that everything would be dedicated to you. God, that you would be our all and in all, in everything, you are everything. And that, God, we would see you glorified, that we would give you honor always, that the things that you cherish, we would cherish, that, God, the things that are important to you would be important to us. And in every way, we would celebrate you and rejoice in you and know the goodness that is of you. God, look at how great your hand of blessing is. Look at how awesome you are. And God, we see you and we know you and you reveal yourself to us. And as you reveal God, you're just so incredible. And I pray that not a single person in this room would not have a vision and a revelation of who you are and the power of who you are and the glory and the goodness that the very love that you have would just be poured out and shed abroad in our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that in every way we could obey you and honor you, that you would be given the glory, that you would be given the praise, that you would be elevated, that Jesus, you would be the Lord in our lives and people would say they are different because they've been with Jesus and that your Holy Spirit would make us different and God, You see our lack. You even see we don't even know how to pray as we ought. We don't even know how to ask for the things. We don't even know what to expect. God, you've got to mentor us and train us in the new way of thinking. And God, you said you would give us your Holy Spirit to do this. We pray you, convict us of sin. Convict us of righteousness. Convict us of judgment. Convict us of who Jesus is. Convict us of your holy ways. Convict us in everything that we may bring our lives to you as a living sacrifice. For this is our reasonable service to you, God, that in everything we may present our lives to you. God, may all the shackles of this world, may all the lusts of it and the things, the cares of life, may they all be churned to dust in our sight. And may we see the glory of you rising within us and among us, on top of us, and throughout this community. God, break the power of darkness. Break the power of principalities and wickedness. Bring forth liberty. Let your holy army and host go forth with a glorious light. God, that we may proclaim the riches of you who called us who made us to be your children forever. What a holy and wonderful calling that we could be called the sons of God. What manner of love you have poured upon us that you would make us in in your own image, in your own likeness. And God, we love your work. We love your ways. And we give you praise, asking all this and believing in you for it. We believe in you, God. And we ask you for all of this in the name of our Savior, our King, on whose account we ask it, Jesus the Christ's account. Amen.